Today, welcome to Fortress Australia. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, as I covered a couple of days ago in my conversations about the budget, there was an assumption made that the borders won't reopen until the middle of next year and migration will be close to zero for quite some time. And it begs a bunch of questions about the economic trajectory ahead because, of course, whilst we can do so much locally, the fact is that we don't necessarily have the mechanisms to be able to grow economically with the borders still shut. To say nothing of civil liberties, people trapped overseas, and a bunch of other questions. Now, there was a very interesting piece from Bloomberg today, which made the point that a smattering of places mainly across the Asia-Pacific region have seen breathtaking victories in the battle against COVID-19 by effectively wiping it out within their borders. But, they said, they now face a fresh test, rejoining the rest of the world, which is still awash in the pathogen. In some ways, the success of COVID-0 locations is becoming a straitjacket. As cities like New York and London return to in-person deal-making and business as usual, tolerating hundreds of daily cases as vaccination gathers pace, financial hubs like Singapore and Hong Kong risk being left behind as they maintain stringent border curbs and try to stamp out single digit flare-ups. After a brutal 18 months that claimed 3.3 million lives worldwide, nations like China, Singapore, Australia and New Zealand have suffered fewer deaths during the entire pandemic than many countries, even highly vaccinated ones, continue to log in a matter of days. That achievement has allowed people to have largely normal lives for much of the past year. Some haven't even had to wear masks, but sustaining this vaulted status has also required stop-start lockdown cycles, near-blanket bans on international travel and strict quarantine policies. The few travellers permitted to enter have had to spend weeks in total confinement, unable to leave a hotel room. Now that mass inoculation drives are allowing other parts of the world to normalise and open up to international travel, experts and residents are starting to question whether walling off from COVID is worth the trade-off if implemented long-term. The whole world is not going to be COVID zero, says Rupali Lamea, Director of Behavioural Implementation Science at the International Vaccine Access Centre at John Hopkins Pool of Public Health. That's not an option here. Aggressive reactions to tiny caseloads may seem overblown to observers in countries facing thousands of infections a day, but the aim is to snuff out coronavirus before more disruptive restrictions like months-long lockdowns are needed, and largely the strategy has worked. Still, the slower pace of vaccination in these places and the threat of new variants has meant that measures have become more and more onerous. New York currently logs 95 new daily cases per million people, and the US has just lifted its mask mandate for those vaccinated. Singapore found just four point new cases per million on Thursday, boosting locally acquired cases to the highest level since July last year and is warning that the situation is on a knife edge. The city-state introduced tighter border restrictions and limited social gatherings after the city of 5.7 million reported 60 locally transmitted infections in a week. Meanwhile, Taiwan recorded 16 local cases on Wednesday, a daily record high and promptly restricted access to gyms and other public venues. And in Hong Kong, anyone living in the same building as a person infected with a new COVID variant 
was required to spend as much as three weeks in government isolation until the policy changed last week. And Australia has said that it won't likely open its international borders until the second half of 2022. And it's worth noting, by the way, that People Covered divides the doses administered for each vaccine type by the number of doses required for full vaccination in this chart. Because we've been so successful, we are even more risk adverse than we were before, said Peter Colligan, a professor of infectious diseases at the Australian National University Medical School in Canberra. We are very intolerant of letting any COVID come into the country, said. The fear has almost gotten out of proportion to what the risk is. Continued isolation is the price these places will have to pay to maintain this approach in the longer term, as other parts of the world learn to tolerate some infections as long as medical systems aren't overwhelmed. Most experts agree that the virus is unlikely to disappear completely. Instead, it is expected to become endemic, meaning it will circulate at some level without sparking the deadly outbreaks seen since late 2019. To maintain zero infection rates, these economies will have to implement measures that are harsher and more strict said Donald Lowe, professor at the Institute of Public Policy of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. This is neither wise nor tenable for much longer, he said. All this puts the places that have done well to suppress COVID-19 so far at a serious disadvantage as their societies, not having been exposed to the possibilities of COVID-19 becoming endemic, are not willing to accept any relaxation of measures that may put their health at risk. Meanwhile, many countries, particularly those in the West that are awash in vaccines, are starting to reopen. But of course, the fact of the matter is that the road to eliminating COVID-19 is long and paved with uncertainties. Many countries are counting on vaccines to build sufficient immunity in their populations, enabling the transmission of the virus to slow to a crawl. But even with the rollout of highly effective vaccines, immunisation coverage may not reach that level, the so-called herd immunity threshold, anytime soon. For one thing, it's not known what level of immunity is required. There's also the threat of emerging coronavirus variants that may weaken the effectiveness of immunisations. But more broadly, there is a political question, because it's clear from recent elections in Australia that the politicians that took the most extreme position with regard to shutting down, locking down and keeping the virus out achieved significant victories at the ballot box. So on the ground, most people, it appears, wants our politicians to keep things locked down. And that's a very interesting positioning when essentially on one hand you have businesses screaming for borders to reopen, and on the other hand, the bulk of the population saying, no, keep the borders closed and keep the virus out. Now, it is worth reflecting on that contention and the interesting question as to which side of the fence politicians ultimately will come down on. In fact, in the UK, Boris Johnson, of course, started pretty relaxed and is now sitting very much on the we must be careful about how we reopen school of management. And in the US, of course, whilst they are releasing some regulations now, it's still not completely clear. So here in Australia, it seems to me that the weight of argument is probably in favour of maintaining the lockdowns for a lot longer. And the Indian case study, where effectively flights were banned for a period, is just one example of that. And this is where we get into difficulty with regard to trading off freedom of individuals, civil liberties, the interests of the community, and the economic consequences of so doing. It is complicated. And of course, the way that the government has solved it here is to signal significant lockdowns and significant further spending. But the question is, 
is that the right way to go? Or are we going to become more and more isolated from the rest of the world as they travel a different path? And while that may be an open question at the moment, I think it's worth thinking about what is the right trade-off between allowing the virus back in and some community transmission versus keeping everything locked down, keeping the borders closed, and keeping the virus out. Because eradication locally is by no means the same as eradication globally. And global eradication, it seems to me, is a light year away at least. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.